Amen. Lord, be with us this morning. Lord, visit us in a new way. Show us who you are and teach us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Legacy Church. Happy Easter. He is risen. Doesn't that feel good? Ah, oh, I love Easter Sunday. My name is Thomas, and I am a pastor here at Legacy Church. We are so glad to have you. It's a little smaller than a normal Sunday. I don't know where everyone is, but no, I'm just kidding. Great to see you. If you're visiting for the first time, welcome. This is already your home before you even walked in the doors. The church is a home for everyone who wants to find a place. Amen? <laughs> About eight years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Israel for the first time. And while I was there, I got the chance to stay in the old city, which is kind of uh, around the boundaries of where first century Jerusalem was. And uh, if you've ever had the chance to stay in the old city, you know how crazy busy it can get. They have these narrow cobblestone streets that, that wind between the buildings. And the streets are lined with vendors that sell everything from spices to scarves. And, and they attract literally hundreds of thousands of tourists every day. And so it's just kind of something you expect when you go to the old city that there's going to be crowds everywhere. But uh, the first night that I was staying in the city, uh, I didn't sleep very well. And so I decided to wake up for an early morning walk on a Sunday morning. And so I set out expecting to find crowds but I found that the city was completely empty. Everybody was still asleep. The shops were closed and I had the whole city to myself. And so I just walked for, for nearly an hour up and down the streets, through the narrow alleyways, past archeological dig sites. I mean, it was crazy. I had the whole city to myself. And eventually I found myself in the courtyard of this giant stone church. I didn't know why it was there or, or its significance, but the doors were open. And so I decided to just kind of check it out. And so I walked into the doors. Right away, I'm hit with this wall of incense and candles. There were thousands of candles lit everywhere. And to my right was this ancient set of stairs that led up to the second level of the church. And, and I had to figure out what, what those led to. So I climbed up the stairs and I found this room that was lined in this incredible mosaic image of Christ being crucified, uh, made with these tiles the size of postage stamps all over the wall, up on the ceiling. And then to the left of this mosaic was this altar that was built around this, this giant rock of stone that was coming out of the wall. And so I stood there admiring it. It was this beautiful scene. And after a couple minutes, I, I walked back down the stairs and made, made my way out of the church. And as I was leaving, I found a sign that read the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So I wrote that name down. And when I got back to my room, I decided to look up this church and figure out where I had been in the city. And when I looked up the church, I was stunned to discover that I was on the traditional site of where Jesus had been crucified and buried. I had no idea. I was there, I had no idea where I was standing. I followed Jesus my whole life. Here I was at the epicenter of the Christian faith where it all began and I had no idea. See, in the year 312, Constantine, the Roman emperor, had a vision of a cross before he went to battle. And after winning the battle, he gave his life to Jesus and he made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. For the first time in history, Christianity was an accepted religion. About 14 years later, he sent a group of bishops back to Jerusalem to map out and preserve the most important Christian sites in the Christian tradition. When he got there and, and the bishops asked the locals where Jesus had been crucified and buried, they pointed to a temple to the Roman gods Jupiter and Venus that were, was on a hill. See, a couple generations earlier, the Romans tried to push Christianity out of the region, and so they did what you're supposed to do. They took their holy sites and built it on your holy sites, so you had nowhere to worship. The ironic thing was that in doing that, they actually preserved the earliest location of his crucifixion and burial. We got the best of them. So they didn't realize that by doing that, they were actually preserving one of the most significant sites of Christianity. It might have been lost to time, but now we know with a good degree of confidence that this is the area where the earliest Christians saw Jesus crucified and buried. 
And so he had this temple to Venus and Jupiter destroyed, and he built what's now called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on the site of both his crucifixion and burial. It's a profound place to visit. And so here I was. I had no idea where I was at. And I discovered that that staircase led up to the top of a hill that the church had been built on. And that rock that was coming out of the wall was a rock that's on the top of the hill that we call Golgotha. And so there I was standing all by myself in the location where Christians for nearly 1,800 years have professed is the location of Jesus' crucifixion. What was meant to be a quiet walk through the old city of Jerusalem on a Sunday morning turned out to be a moment of profound discovery. 2,000 years ago, a woman named Mary and her companions had a similar experience. On a Sunday morning when dawn was breaking, they left their homes to walk through the old city of Jerusalem to find the tomb of a friend who had been recently killed. The shops were closed, the streets were quiet, and the women were let to deal with the business at hand. Just a couple of days earlier, their friend had been arrested. Late at night, they found him in the Garden of Gethsemane, a garden on the other side of Jerusalem. And when they found him, they took him, arrested him, questioned him, brought false accusations against him, and then they beat him and took him outside the city and had him crucified. And at this point in the story, He is now laying dead in a tomb just outside of the city walls. At the time, the Roman tradition was to take men who had been crucified down from the crosses after they died and buried them in mass graves. It was easier and cheaper that way. But there was a man named Joseph of Arimathea when Christ was crucified who went to Pilate, the local governor, and begged him to take Jesus' body. When Pilate agreed, Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus and placed him on a preparation table in a tomb nearby. Now at the time, stone tombs were expensive because they had to be carved by hand out of large stone. And so only the wealthiest people had stone tombs. But this tomb was new. It had never been used before. And so when Jesus arrived, he was laid on this preparation table. Now, in the first century, the tradition when it came to burying someone in a tomb was that you laid them on a preparation table and within a short time of of dying, you rubbed their skin with spices and oils and then wrapped them in cloths. The reason for that was twofold. Number one, it was to help with the smell of a decomposing body. The second reason was that the oils and the spices helped your skin to break down and your body to decompose. And so after wrapping you up, they would roll a giant stone in front of the tomb and seal it so that the body couldn't be disturbed. And for the next year, the body would lay on the preparation table decomposing. After a year, they would come back to the tomb, roll the stone away, and take the bones that were left on the table and put them in what's called an ossuary box. It's a box about three feet by two feet by two feet. And they would take that ossuary box and they would put it in a a hole that they had carved on the inside of that tomb. And they would make space on the preparation table for the next person in your family or, or your friend group to die. In a tomb like this, you might have had five or six or seven people buried in ossuary boxes along the wall. In other words, on this Easter morning, the women were doing exactly what normal women in the first century would do. They had their spices and their oils and their supplies ready to be taken to care for Jesus' body before the tomb is sealed for a year. But as you know, when they got to the tomb, they didn't find what they had expected. Instead of a sealed tomb, they found a stone that had been rolled away. Instead of a body, they found scraps of linen that were meant to be wrapped around his body, laying on the preparation table. In other words, when they got there, the body was gone, and these women were distraught. I mean, they were supposed to find the body of their beloved, and instead they just found an empty preparation table and scraps of linen. They didn't know what to think. I mean, who would? The body of Jesus was gone. But in a moment, they would discover that what was supposed to be a moment of mourning was meant to be a moment of celebration. In an instant, the course of human history would be changed forever when the world would discover that this Jesus, who had been crucified, was alive again. A confirmation that he was, in fact, the exalted Messiah that the world had been waiting for. In Luke chapter 24, verse 1, we find the story of this moment. If you have Bibles, you can turn there. Otherwise, it should be on the screen. 
Luke writes this in Luke chapter 24. He says, On the first day of the week, early Sunday morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, that he'll be crucified and on the third day be raised again? And then they remembered his words. You know, every time I read this story, I'm amazed at how quickly their sorrow turns into celebration. It's just this moment where they go from crushing grief to life-changing transformation. You know, in one moment, they're walking to the tomb overwhelmed with sorrow, and the next moment, they're light as feathers. In one moment, they're walking to the tomb, and the next moment, they're running to the upper room. In their darkest hour, when all hope is lost, when their life is spinning out of control, they encounter Jesus. When it seems like there's nothing left to do, they encounter Jesus. And when that happens, their lives are left changed forever. You know, I'm always amazed when this happens. As a pastor, I hear stories like this all the time, and I never get tired of them. When people are in their darkest moments, when they have nothing left to live for, in recovery ministry, we call it rock bottom, right? When your life has fallen apart, people find Jesus. And when they tell me this story, they always seem surprised as if they're the first one to do it. When in fact, millions and millions of people in their hour of grief and pain and sorrow find hope in a God that loves them deeply. You know, we live in a world that types to, uh, that tries to discourage this type of faith, don't we? I like to call them prayers of desperation, deathbed prayers. I want you to know that if you pray in a moment of desperation, that's the right thing to do. Prayers of desperation are not bad things. If you're struggling and suffering, you should be praying. But the world will teach you that this choice is a sign of weakness. That maybe it's even a sign that God doesn't exist at all. People will tell you that we've invented God to give us comfort in times of need. That he's a figment of our imagination that we've created to make us feel better when the troubles of life are too much to manage. In reality, though, the world resents us for the fact that we find peace and hope in a God that loves us in a world that can offer us none. You know, it doesn't take long to realize that we live in a broken world, does it? I mean, you don't have to be religious to recognize that. Everywhere we look, we find pain. Everywhere we look, we find suffering. Whether it's someone that we love passing away, whether it's someone that we love coming down with a terrible medical condition, whether it's some child dying on the other side of the world, or a marriage breaking up, everywhere we look, there are people in pain. It also doesn't take long to see that our world has no solution for these problems. You might know what I mean. You might have had those dark moments, the dark moments of the soul, in which you looked for solutions in the world and you came up empty-handed. Sometimes it feels like we can't get out from under it. There's no easy solution. There's no book you can read, no habit you can form to escape the pain that our world brings us. And in those moments, the only thing that we can figure to do is to numb the pain, right? We don't have the power to heal it, and so we look for ways to numb it. it might be through alcohol, and so we drink every day. Every day we drink. Or maybe we turn to drugs, illegal drugs, or legal drugs, prescription drugs, whatever we need to take the edge off. Or maybe we harm ourselves. Something to give us relief from the terrible, crushing pain that we feel every day. The world hurts and we don't know how to deal with it. When we lose control of our lives and we have nowhere left to turn, we look to numb the pain instead of healing it because we have no other choice. 
Now, I would imagine that the disciple Peter felt the same sense of hopelessness. Right before Jesus had been arrested, uh, Jesus and his disciples are sharing a meal in the upper room, the last meal that they would share together before he went to the cross. And during that meal, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Truly I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. This is the same meal at which Jesus called out Judas for betraying him. He said, Judas, you're going to betray me. And then he turns to Peter, one of his inner circle, one of his most important disciples, and he says, you're going to do the same. And Peter looks at him like, are you kidding me, Jesus? Do you know who I am? I am the rock. I'm Peter. And it says in verse 35 that Peter declared, even if I die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Peter knew the right answer, didn't he? In other words, Peter was all in. Peter was totally committed. Peter was a ride or die kind of disciple. He was the kind of disciple that could be counted on every time that he would give up everything to follow Jesus. At least that's how he thought of himself, right? Because only a couple of hours later, what is Peter doing? Do you remember? He's doing exactly what Jesus said he would be doing, right? He's disowning Jesus. Just a few hours later, three times, Peter is accused of being one of those followers of Jesus, to which he says, no, don't associate me with that man. Turns out he wasn't all in after all. It wasn't, he wasn't a, a ride or die kind of disciple. He was a coward. I love how Matthew describes his reaction after he disowns Jesus. It's this beautiful, concise phrase. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, it says that after he disowned Jesus, that Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Have you ever wept bitterly? That deep soul grief where it feels like something is coming out of, out, out of you that you can't control? Peter goes outside and he weeps bitterly. Why? Because he knows what he's done and it's broken him. And yet, on Sunday morning, when the tomb was discovered empty and the women returned to tell the disciples what they've seen, listen to what Matthew, or what Luke writes in Luke 24, verse 9. It says, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told them to, this, to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Peter, however, ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. In his moment of greatest despair, when his life had fallen apart, when he had nothing left to live for, he went to the tomb and found hope and healing. Imagine what Peter must have been feeling in this moment. On the one hand, he must have desperately wanted for this to be true. I mean, imagine if it were. Imagine what that would mean for Jesus. Imagine what that would mean for his identity, for his mission, for his purpose, for the disciples. He must have desperately wanted to believe that Jesus really had come back to life. On the other hand, he must have been terrified by what Jesus would say to him when he got there. You know, the last time that Peter is mentioned in the Gospels is when he went away and wept bitterly. Which means that for three days, we have no idea what Peter was doing. We don't know where he was. We don't know if he was at the crucifixion. We don't know if he was at the burial. Most likely, where he was was in a hole weeping for three days straight. Peter was suffering because in his moment of temptation, he failed. In his moment of trial, he was lost. It turns out he wasn't a ride or die disciple. He was a coward. He was a man who struggled with faith. And yet, when the tomb was empty, he still went. Why? Well, I think it's because he knew that if he could just see Jesus again, if he could just talk with him and, and explain what had happened, if he could just beg for forgiveness, that Jesus would have to forgive him, right? I mean, this is Jesus, after all. This is kind of what he does, right? Jesus would have to make it right. 
See, before Easter Sunday, uh, Peter was looking at a lifetime of regret. With Jesus dead, he would have no way to make amends. The last time that Peter saw Jesus, according to the Gospels, is when he is being taken away, arrested, and beaten. That's the last time he's seen him. And so, of course, he wants to see Jesus again. Of course, he wants to make amends. And so he goes to see if what he's heard is true. And when he does, he finds hope. You know, just a a few days before his resurrection, Judas, in the same way, betrays Jesus. You know, we don't often characterize Judas and Peter together, but actually their stories are are fairly similar. Both abandon Jesus in his time of need. Both fall short of the calling that they've committed to. But despite their shared failures, we think of them differently, don't we? And I think it's because after their failures, their lives take dramatically different turns. See, after Jesus had been arrested, Peter goes and and he maintains his relationship with the disciples. But Judas goes and he hangs himself from a tree. Why? Because he was so overwhelmed with grief for what he had done. He couldn't face himself. He couldn't face the darkness that was within him. But Peter, on the other hand, he stayed connected to the church. And eventually he found reconciliation with Jesus. You know, in my opinion, the saddest part about the story of Judas was not his betrayal, as bad as that was. The saddest part about the story of Judas was that he had lived with the Messiah for three years. That he had done ministry with him. He had done miracles with him. He had seen Jesus' power. He had beheld his wonder. And yet he still couldn't imagine a love that was big enough to include him. I mean, could you imagine that? He was an inch away. He had the grace of Christ in his hands, and yet he couldn't imagine a grace big enough to cover over every ounce of shame and self-loathing and sin that he carried with him. I mean, that's the real tragedy of Judas. You know, I'm convinced, and this is just my opinion, but I'm convinced that if Judas could have just held on for a few more days, if he could have just lasted a a few days longer, that he would have found peace with Jesus. I think if he had come back, he had confessed his sins, fell at his feet, and begged for forgiveness, Jesus would have said, come and follow me. But he didn't. Judas was killed by his own remorse because his concept of God wasn't big enough to cover over his own sin. He allowed himself to succumb to his own pain and brokenness, and that prevented him from experiencing the deep and profound life-giving love that Jesus has to offer us. The band is going to come forward now, and as they do, uh, I'm going to wrap up with this. If you're here today and you're in pain, if you're here today and you're suffering under the weight of your grief and sorrow, and sadness, whatever that looks like. Maybe you're suffering physically, or mentally, or socially, or emotionally. You might be here dying of loneliness. You might be here struggling with depression. Whatever your pain looks like, I want you to know that Jesus wants to meet you there. He wants to meet you right in the midst of your suffering, and he wants to offer you healing. That's what he's here for that he's alive and he's here to begin a good work in you. There's nothing that you have done and there's nothing that you can do to stop the love of God from reaching you if you're willing to accept it. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul, who was a converted Jew, wrote this in Romans chapter 8. He said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. The tomb is empty. Jesus is at work. He's alive today. All we have to do is be willing to surrender control of our lives over to him and accept his free gift of hope and healing. That's what they discovered on that first Easter morning. 
This morning, we're going to be doing baptisms at all three of our worship services, which means that you're going to have the opportunity to see people who right now, today, in this place, are experiencing the hope and healing that comes from a relationship with Jesus. And I love to see this happen because it reminds us that what the women saw on that first Easter Sunday wasn't the end of the story. It wasn't the last chapter. It wasn't the conclusion that it was just the beginning of something much bigger. The beginning of a a kingdom movement breaking into the world. The beginning of God's light pressing back against the darkness that surrounds us. A Jesus movement that you're invited to join today. If you've never taken this step of faith before, and you feel like God is speaking to you this morning, that's not by accident. God has seen fit to have you here this morning to hear this message, that hope is not lost. That on that Easter morning, the empty tomb was the beginning of a Jesus revolution. And so I wanna give you a chance to introduce yourself to Jesus. It's not hard, it never is. All you have to do is talk to him like a friend. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for you in a moment. And I'm going to encourage you to say these words in the quiet of your heart. Make them your own. They're not magic words. They're not a superpower. They're just words of introduction. And I want to encourage you to do that today. After we pray, we're going to have a time of baptism for people who are ready. Some people have been scheduled to be baptized. They've signed up. They're ready to make this proclamation of faith. Some of you might be giving your life to Jesus this morning. You say, I'm tired of the hopelessness. I'm tired of the brokenness. I need something more. The world has let me down. And if that's you, then I want you to pray this prayer. And then I want to give you the chance to have the courage to come up in faith and be baptized yourself. Baptism is just a symbol of our faith that we're burying our old life and we're coming back to life in Jesus. And so if that's you, as people who are scheduled to be baptized are lining up, you can just come and get in line. We have towels. We have shirts. There's no reason to be shy. Every single one of you are probably thinking right now, but what about my brunch appointment, right? (laughs) What about my family lunch? And if that's you, I want you to know brunch can wait. It really can. Don't let brunch be a barrier to faith. All right? If you're ready to introduce your life to Jesus, pray with me now. Lord, I am broken. I am lost. And I need your hope and healing. Jesus, take my sin, take my pain, take my suffering, and replace it with life. Come into my heart and lead me from this day forward into your life everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to do baptisms a little differently this morning. We're going to call people up, and while they're getting baptized, I'm going to read them four questions of faith. I'll I'll share them with you in a minute. But as I'm reading those questions to them, the band's going to continue, and we invite you to worship God, to be the soundtrack to their baptism. And if you're interested in getting baptized, just come on up in line. These are the four questions we're going to ask them this morning. Number one, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Number two, do you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and resurrected to life? Yes. Number three, do you renounce your sins and accept his free gift of grace? Yes. And number four, are you committed to following Jesus no matter the cost, without conditions or excuses for the rest of your life? Yes. If that's you, come forward to be baptized now. I'm going to baptize starting, then we're going to hand it off to one of our other pastors on our staff because I got to get up to Tierra Santa to preach the gospel again. Amen. All right, let's worship. Kelly, Kelly, why don't you guys come first?
Yeah.